Eicha Atzda. Our tradition, we connect to God in, in many different ways. We understand God as father, king. When I was in yeshiva, uh, we had an exercise to think about what it'd be like if we thought of God as mother. What would that ev evoke? Here, um, we're, we're understanding God based on Rav Soloveitchik and kind of just how I re I'm reading the text here as our spouse. And it's relating to a specific, um, ex a specific moment within the relationship, the, a breakup of the relationship and a certain reflection on what it was like in the good days. That's how I'm understanding this elegy. Um, and so Rav Soloveitchik reads this language here on, if you look on page 216, it says, remember God, what happened to us? So to us could be what happened to Am Yisrael, but to us could be what happened to us? What happened to our relationship? If anybody ever been through a, a breakup with somebody they were very connected to, you know, a lot of times that's a question you might ask yourself, what happened to us? Everything was so great. How did it all fall apart? What, how, did, how do we start at that one place and we are where we are right now? And so that's kind of like the theme of this, of this Kina. And if you look just on page 216, like towards the bottom two paragraphs, for instance, um, it says the second to last paragraph, how could you abandon your sanctuary and your rage, allowing strangers to defile it and not remember the wedding vows at Horeb. So you see here wedding vows, like the, the, the of Elazar Khalir and wants us to, to feel this feeling. He's, you're feeling the feeling of, we were once, we had wedding vows at Chorev. And how, how do we end up where we are right now? Similarly, the next one, and not remember the next uh, paragraph, and not remember the precious friendship that we had. So there's a lot of pieces here. Rav Soloveitchik um, in, in his commentary talks about uh, two parts I want to touch on. One is um, in the third paragraph in Hebrew, it talks about the viud. It's all under the theme of us mourning the relationship that was. And so he says, his language is really beautiful. And he says, what's this, what says viud it talks about? What's this viud? He says, a viud is a rendezvous. Okay, he says like every Jew, it is God's promise that every Jew has a rendezvous from time to time with him. Every Jew, no matter how plain or simple, will be able to rise to the level of spiritual greatness that results from God from time to time bestowing his greatness upon a person. This is basically something reflecting upon those times when we had such closeness to Hashem, we don't have those close, that closeness again. Uh, another part which he talks about is, is in that same, um, in the next paragraph in Hebrew, the second left paragraph on page 217, it talks about Zvul. It talks, God was once in the Zvul. What's a Zvul? Zvul is an intimate place in one's house. In the temple, it's the Holy of Holies. So God was once with us in the most intimate place in the Holy of Holies. And now the enemy has entered the Holy of Holies. And that's the whole theme of this, of this Kina. Uh, and this is one way to connect to Tisha B'Av. Uh, not just thinking about the temple, not just thinking about um, Jerusalem, but also thinking about Hashem, thinking about what once was, the connection, the intimacy that we once had, and think about how we're missing that so much today. We're going to continue on page 217. I'm going to move forward to page 383, um, Kina 18, and it starts, Etiv, Etiv, Imach. That's page 383 in the Koran version that we have, and it starts with Ata Amarta. So if you just take a look at the structure, uh, I think it's important in general to try to take a look at the structure of these keynote, because otherwise when you're reading it, it's kind of hard to follow sometimes. It's hard for me to follow the Hebrew, and I'm pretty well versed in Hebrew. So the more I feel we can get a, a, foot, a foothold in the text, I think it can help us when we read it. So if you just take a look, the structure here um, is basically vata velama. If you look on page 383, vata velama, vata velama. So an example, it says, you, you, ata, assured us I will be exceedingly good to you and that your people and I will be distinguished. So you promised this, Hashem. You said this. Then it asks, lama, why then do knaves profane your name and do you not pour forth your wrath on them? Okay, so... That's the structure of it. Basically, you said this, this is what you were supposed to do. Then why did you do that? And when I was reading this, uh, I was um, reminded of a, like a, disc, a, a back and forth in Israeli, in, like in the news, actually, in Israel. Many years ago, there was this, I think it was a rabbi in yeshiva. 
he lost a student in some sort of terrorist attack. And at the funeral, um, he asked, he read, basically read what King David said, Keli, Keli, Lama Azaftani, Hashem, Hashem, God, God, why did you leave me? He said that at the funeral, and it was, it was like on TV and everything. And the commentators, I was watching this on the news, and the commentators like, how could that rabbi say that out loud at the funeral saying, God, well, how, how, why have you left me? That's basically kind of doing what they did in this, in this kina, asking God, why did you not fulfill? Why did you leave me? You're supposed to be with me. At basically asking questions of God. And then some, another rabbi said, this is, first of all, King David said this, so he can say it. But in addition, this is, Judaism isn't just about um, us sim accepting simply everything that, that happens to us. It's asking questions, it's challenging, it's trying to make sense and process of what's going on with us in our connection with Hashem. And I would add, and that's like the centerpiece of this, of this keynote, I would add also what, what Rav Cook says. Rav Cook says, um, the pure faith cannot, ar cannot rise aside from, aside from a situation where someone gives themselves the opportunity to ask questions. And when Abba Ta'ata, it's even more intense in Hebrew. I mean, if you want to be in a connection with Hashem, you have to ask questions. And also express your feelings. And also admit that things aren't always great. A strong connection with the spouse or with a friend is built on that ability to have that freedom to push back, to ask questions, to, to express your feelings and what you're going through. I think that's what the Kina is trying to tell us here. There's one, one condition um, to this, and that's where the Kina ends. It's on page... 384, at the end of it, the very end of the keynote, it says, after all the questioning back and forth, you said this, in the end, it upholds, the, the, the author upholds his faith. You are right with regard to all that happened. With you, O Lord, is the right, and we affirm lo this lovingly. I want to say, I don't think this is just a, a conclusion at the end of this elegy, kind of just like trying to make things all better after all the questioning. I think this is a certain assumption throughout the keynote. From a place of faith, that God is right, we ask those questions. And then when we ask those questions, they can even come to strengthen our faith as well. Because if we deny what we're really feeling about what's going on with us, we don't have a true uh, authentic connection with Hashem. So this Kina is trying to experience the mourning from an authentic place. And that's really what we're doing throughout all of Tisha B'Av. We're crying, we're expressing our feelings, and hopefully that will strengthen our faith in Hashem, strengthen our faith in the redemption and all the promises that go with that. So we're on uh, 383, Batamarda. Uh, so we're going to move to Kina 28 on page 488, 489. Um, is Kina starts with the words, Ech Tinachamuni Hevel. So this Kina, if you pay attention, kind of just while, while you open up to that page, if you look inside, you'll see it's in alphabetical order. And again, this is um, the last kina by El of Elazar Khalir. And this kina is alphabetical order, obviously. The, the letter He talks about Nebuchadnezzar. And then if you move forward to letter ta Tet on the next page, 490, you have Persia. And you go to Kaf, Greece, Mem, Edom, and then it has other descriptions as well. So Ralph Soloveitchik asks a question. He says, why, why does the, uh, the author of this kina pile all the calamities together into one kina? So you could say it's, it's a historical review of all the things that happened to us, similar um, to what Ryan discussed. Um, that's, that's also true. Ralph Soloveitchik goes a different direction. He says, um, the author, he offers two options. I think they're both powerful. The first one is just the idea that we're suffering on Tisha B'Av, but this is nothing new. Uh, what we went through in Tisha B'Av, it's what we're going through throughout all of our history. And so we say on Pesach, every generation, every generation, enemies come upon us um, to destroy us, and Hashem saves us from them. So this is just every generation, there's always some sort of oppressor. And so this idea of putting them all together is basically this idea that, you know, everyone's, there's different faces, but it's the same idea of people coming and trying to um, destroy the Am Yisrael or to harm them. Another piece I thought was really powerful and kind of reminded me of some of my own times when I've been in mourning, this idea of when you're in deep mourning, um, you kind of lose track of time, you lose track of um, reality. And so that if you look on page 488, 
second paragraph, it says, on this day every year, time changes for me. Someone who's in deep mourning over the temple, to the similar to deep mourning that one can have over a loved one. I don't know if you, a lot of us have suffered the loss of loved ones. When you're in that state of mourning, it's a very disorienting state. state and um, everything just kind of, everything uh, merges with everything else. And that's the experience, Rav Soloveitchik says, of this, of this elegy, of this kina, where it's, place, it's bringing this, this calamity, that tragedy, and it's putting them all together. Because when you're in deep mourning over the temple, it can be so intense if you're on that level that basically it, it just merges together with all the other calamities and you can't even keep track anymore. It's a very deep state of mourning. And when I was thinking, when I was like reading this, I was thinking about an um, experience I had when I was in Jerusalem. You know, me and a, a friend of mine, we used to do all kinds of like spiritual excursions to the graves of holy, holy rabbis, um, go to the Kotel. And we used to go also to the, uh, the tunnels and um, that um, my friend used to always, my friend used to tell them like that it was his birthday and they used to let us through the tunnel. We were young. They used to let us through the tunnels um, to get like as close to the Holy of Holies as possible. There's a certain location. Any of you ever been there? It's like these, yeah, you get as like, I mean, the, the Western wall isn't parallel to the Holy of Holies. It's the Western wall, but it's like, it's, it's further, it's away. You can get farther, deeper into the Western wall to the point that you're almost like parallel to the Holy of Holies and let you in there if you're an important person or if it's your birthday. So we got in there and I remember we were like excited. We were 18, 19, 20. Uh, and we were, so, we were like, this is so amazing. This is powerful. And when we got there, we were like, just like, like kind of like elated about it. And we, we saw this gentleman, this old, this, I think it was a Yemenite man. It's like singing sing with the Yemenite um, like uh, melody. And he was sitting there at that location, just reading Psalms and so, certain Psalms connected to the temple. He was in deep mourning over the temple. I know that that, that kind of between like our mood and his mood was pretty powerful. Um, but when we saw him doing that, at least for me, it had a very strong effect. You know, he was like deep, deep in mourning over the temple at the spot of the temple. And he was, he was, he was completely took over his, his being. I could tell he was like so into it. You have to do that. It was like, it wasn't like, it wasn't after midnight, but it was like late in the night. Um, he could have been doing anything, but he was there at that holy site praying for the temple. And that's kind of what this, this, this Kina is pointing us to, this type of deep mourning for the temple to the point that we're so engrossed in it. I mean, he didn't even, I don't even know if he knew that we came in and went out, actually. And that's kind of like the morning we're supposed to try, try to tap into a little bit on Tisha B'Av to the point that things get mixed up. We're just experiencing all kinds of emotions, different, different stages and, and, and time periods of mourning. Um, and, and trying to get as deep as we can into it through these explanations and through um, each kina as we move along. So we're going to move along into this kina now. This is page 489, Ech Tenachamuni Hevel. We move to kina 31, page 515. It's Esh Tukad, Bekir B. Take a look at this kina on page 515. You'll see the structure is pretty clear. It says, "Betzeisi mi Mitzrayim, betzeisi mi Yisraelim." Goes back and forth. Betzeisi Mitzrayim. This is com com it's comparing our experience when we left Egypt to our experience when we left Jerusalem. One being one of celebration, the other one being one of mourning. So I'll just read a few of them to you. A fire burns within me as I recall when I left Egypt. I will invoke lamentations that I remember when I left Jerusalem. Then Moses sang an unforgettable song when I left Egypt, whereas Jeremiah lamented and wailed a woeful wail when I left Jerusalem. And it goes on, we, and we sing this with a certain melody, which we'll sing in a moment. Um, but this, this idea of leaving um, is another piece to uh, the mourning. And when I was, this brought to my mind another story I have from my time in Israel. Um, I'm actually going to Israel this week, so I'm thinking about that. Um, so I, I had friends who were, who were staying in Gush Katif at the time uh, when, when that, that community was you know, uprooted and, and they were kind of clearing this, the, the area in Gaza um, in that whole negotiation. And I have friends who were there at the time and they were kind of, they were, they were protesting at the time. I wanted to go and support uh, the people there to be with my friends. 
So I went kind of towards the end. They were there for like a long time. But I was in Gush Katif at the time uh, when all those Jews were removed from their homes. And I saw them leaving, leaving that be those beautiful towns. Um, it was a very traumatic sight. So I, this kind of, I, you kind of have to draw from your own experience to some extent to try to connect to what we're, what we're talking about. But I saw um, people being removed from their homes, children crying, um, neighborhoods raised completely like that, like that, like a few, like a week earlier, we're, 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 we're up and, and a beautiful locations, uh, like a, a synagogues. And so that sadness of being kind of uprooted from your location is a unique type of sadness. All the memories, all the experiences, all the wonderful um, times they spent in those communities in, in that be those beautiful synagogues, all those they take with them as they leave. Right. And then later on, that, that burns inside of them. I think that's why this text opens up with a fire burns within me, right? It's this fire, it's experience of, I was once in this place, I'm no longer there, but I can't let go. I don't wanna let go of all those good times, all those good memories. I think that's like at the centerpiece of this, um, of this Kina. And so I think that's what we're supposed to be thinking about as we read it as well, kind of this idea of, um, the fire inside of us. And I came across Gush Katif people, people who left were forced to leave Gush Katif when I went to Yeshiva a few months afterwards. Because my Yeshiva in Gush Etzion, Alon Shfut, they made, they, we had dorms and they opened up the dorms for all the people, for many people from Gush Katif. And I remember it was a very hard, many of them lost their homes completely. They didn't have homes. They had to find new homes. And they were, they were in deep mourning over that experience. And they were, basically the fire was still burning inside of them. And I don't doubt that till today, the fire burns inside of them. Maybe it's a fire of anger. Um, there was like a, a, a statement that was going, lo nishkach, lo nislach at that time. We're not gonna forget, forget we're not gonna forgive. That was like a, like, a, 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 like a saying that was being spread. And I think that burning, that's probably still, probably still burning inside of them. And I think we're, trying to feel a little bit of that fire by reading this, like when we left Egypt, but what's like when we left Jerusalem, just to feel some of those feelings as you read this in, on page 515, Eshtukat. We're on our final Kina. This is Elitzion, which is on page 611, Kina 45. <clears throat> so Rabbi Soloveitchik says something really, uh, really nice about this Kina, like his explanation, I think is, is spot on. He says that, let's read you his words. This Kina, this is on page 614 are his words. This Kina recited while standing has traditionally been the last of the Kina recited on the morning of Tisha B'Av. With this Kina, we close the formal recitation of the Kina. It is not, he says like this, the motif of this Kina and the reason that is read, the reason that it is, it is a closing kina is that no matter how much we have cried and grieved with the recitation of the keynote, it is not sufficient. We must continue to mourn for the Beit HaMikdash. She so says here in the next paragraph, we should continue to mourn. At the point where we are ready to close the book, keynote and depart, we say no keynote can ever be finished until the Beit HaMikdash is rebuilt. That's the idea of this kina, and I think it's hinted to in the language of the kina. So if you look at page 611, the first word is Eli which means to mourn. So we should continuously mourn. I mean, today's, we mourn more intense, in a more intense way, but should continue to mourn. And then it brings alai, 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 meaning al, al, al. So that's el, which is means to mourn, then al, al, on all these other things. So today obviously is more intense mourning, but we should continue to think about the temple as you go along. And I think that that's also hinted to in, the, in, the, in like the, the main, uh, verse here, which starts, Z lament Zion in her cities like a woman in her labor pains. That's today. Basically, we're experiencing mourning in a very intense way. You know, when the holidays come around, like when Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur come around, we're very focused on tshuva. Doesn't mean you don't, you don't have to do tshuva the rest of the year. Obviously, you have to do your repent the rest of the year. But that's a, the main focus is that day. So today is like the like the labor pains, like the most intense mourning we have on the temple about the temple uh, throughout the year. But but this mourning should continue with us throughout the year, because we want the temple to be rebuilt. We want us to, uh, Amisol, uh, dignity and, and, and pride to be restored in the world. So that's the next part. Like a maiden girl in the sackcloth for the husband of her youth. So that's a different type of mourning. That's a mourning not just about what's going on in the present, 
what, what happened in the past. And so these are two forms of mourning. One is like today, the more intense mourning, but also mourning that will happen throughout the year. As we look back uh, on the husband of our youth or on our, on our loved one of, on Yerushalayim and the temple throughout the year. So let's keep that in mind as you read about all the different types of mourning here. And also to take this mourning with us throughout the year and so that it propels us to do good things and to continuously mourn and yearn for the building of Yerushalayim.